stream, we are doing a Halloween storytelling for Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Alright, so this one is called the Wendigo. Do you guys know what Wendigos are? A wealthy man wanted to go hunting in a part of northern Canada, where few people have ever hunted. He traveled to a trading post and tried to find a guide to take him, but no one would do it. It was too dangerous, they said. Finally, he found an Indian who needed money badly, and he agreed to take him. The Indian's name was De Fago. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. De Fago, maybe. They made camp in the snow near a large frozen lake. For three days they hunted, but they had nothing to show for it. The third night a windstorm came up. They lay in their tent listening to the wind howling the trees whipping back and forth. To see the storm better, the hunter opened the tent flap. When he saw, what he saw startled him. There wasn't a breath of air stirring. The trees were perfectly standing still. Yet he could hear the wind howling. And the more he listened, the more it sounded as if it was calling De Fago's name. De Fago, it called. I must be losing my mind, the hunter thought. Squeak, 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 squeak. But De Fago had gotten out of his sleeping bag. He was huddled in the corner of the tent, his head buried in his arms. What's this all about? The hunter asked. It's nothing, De Fago said, but the wind continued to call to him, and De Fago became more tense and more restless. De Fago, he calls. Wait, where was I? Okay. Suddenly, he jumped to his feet and he began to run from the tent. But the hunter grabbed him and wrestled him to the ground. You can't leave me out here, the hunter shouted. Then the wind called again. De Fago broke loose and ran into the darkness. The hunter could hear him screaming as he went. Again and again he cried, Oh, my fiery feet, my burning feet of fire. Ayo, hey, feet. Then his voice faded away, and the wind died down. At daybreak, the hunter followed De Fago's tracks in the snow. They went through the woods, down toward the lake, then out onto the ice. But soon he noticed something strange. The steps De Fago had taken got longer and longer. They were no longer human beings. It was if something had helped him hurry away. Yabe. The hunter followed the tracks out to the middle of the lake, but there they disappeared. At first, he thought that Devago had fallen through the ice, but there wasn't any hole. Then he thought that something had pulled him off the ice into the sky, but that didn't make any sense. As he stood wondering what had happened, the wind picked up again. Soon it was howling, as it had the night before. Then he heard De Fago's voice. It was coming from up above, and again, he heard De Fago screaming. <gasps> My fiery feet, my burning feet. But there was nothing to be seen. Now the hunter wanted 
rides up and down the valley. Donald turned on the radio and found some music, but the announcer broke in with a news bulletin. A murderer had escaped from the state prison. He was armed with a knife and was headed south on foot. His left hand was missing. In its place, he wore a hook, like a pirate. Let's roll up the windows and lock the doors, said Sarah. That's a good idea, said Donald. The prison isn't too far away. Maybe we should really go home. But it's only ten o'clock, said Donald. I don't care what time it is. I want to go home. Look, Sarah, said Donald. He's not going to climb all the way up here. Why would he do that? Even if he did, all the doors are locked. How could he get in? Donald, he could take that hook and break through the window and open the door, she said. I'm scared. I want to go home. Donald was annoyed. Girls are always are afraid of something, he said. As he started the car, Sarah thought she heard someone or something scratching at her door. Did you hear that? She asked as they roared away. It sounded like somebody was trying to get in. Oh, sure, said Donald. Soon they got to her house. Would you like to come in and have some cocoa? She asked. No, he said. I've got to go home. He went around to the other side of the car to let her out. And hanging on the door was a hook. My God. They almost got... They almost got caught. Thank you. 
from an undertaker's helper. It had been used in a funeral for another young woman, and the helper had stolen it just before she was buried. Why would they do that? Oh my god. Why would you do that? It, uh, it means don't steal people from dead, you know, don't, don't steal from, from people who have died. Do not grieve, rob, or what else is wrong with these people? I don't know. Crazy. All right. Let's not go there. Yeah. Uh, the next story is called High Beams. The girl driving the old blue sedan was a senior at the high school. She lived on a farm about eight miles away and used the car to drive back and forth. She had driven into town that night to see a basketball game. Now she was on her way home. As she pulled away from the school, she noticed a red pickup truck following her out of the parking lot. A few minutes later, the truck was still behind her. I guess we're going the same direction, she thought. She began to watch the truck in her mirror. When she changed her speed, the driver of the truck changed his speed. When she passed a car, so did he. When he turned on, oh, then he turned on his high beams, flooding the car with light. He left them on for almost a minute. He probably wants to pass me, she thought. But she was becoming uneasy. Usually, she drove home over the back road. Not too many people went that way. But when she turned onto that road, so did the truck. I've got to get away from him, she thought, and she began to drive faster. He then turned on his high beams again. After a minute, he turned them off. Then he turned them on again and then off again. She drove even faster, but the truck's driver stayed right behind her. Then he turned on his high beams again. Once more, the car was ablaze with light. What is he doing, she wondered. What does he want? Then he turned them off again, but a minute later, he had them on again, and he left them on. As she pulled into her driveway, the truck driver pulled in right behind her. She jumped from the car and ran to the house. Call the police, she screamed at her father. Out in the doorway, she could see the driver of the truck. He had a gun in his hand. When the police arrived, they started to arrest him, but he pointed to the girl's car. You don't want me, he said. You want him. Crouched behind the driver's seat, there was a man with a knife. As the driver of the truck explained it, the man slipped into the, car's, the girl's car just before she had left the school. He saw it happen, but there was no way he could stop it. He thought about getting the police, but he was afraid to leave her. So he followed the car. Every time the man in the back seat tried to reach up to overpower her, the driver of the truck turned on his high beams. Then the man dropped down, afraid that someone might see him. <gasps> Yo, he saved her life. That's crazy. Yeah, sometimes things are not what it seems. 
Before she could say a word, the man laughed hysterically and hung up. Who was it? asked Richard. Some nut, said Doreen. What did I miss? At 93. Oh, wait, at 9.30. The telephone rang again. Doreen answered it. It was the man who had called before. I'll be there soon, he said. And he laughed and hung up. Who was it? The children asked. Some crazy person, she said. About ten o'clock, the telephone rang. Jenny got to it first. Hello, she said. It was the same man. One more hour, he said, and he laughed and hung up. He said one more hour. What does that mean? asked Jenny. Don't worry about it, said Doreen. It's somebody fooling around. I'm scared, said Jenny. About 10.30, the telephone rang once more. When Doreen picked it up, the man said, Pretty soon now. And he laughed. Why are you doing this? Doreen screamed, and he hung up. Was it that guy again? asked Brian. Yes, said Doreen. I'm going to call the operator and complain. The operator told her to call back if it happened again, and she would try to trace the call. At eleven o'clock, the telephone rang again. Doreen answered it. Very soon now, the man said, and he laughed and hung up. Doreen called the operator. Almost at once, she called back. That person is calling from a telephone upstairs. She said, you better leave. Get the police. <gasps> Just then, a door upstairs opened. A man they had never seen before started down the stairs toward them. As they ran from the house, he was smiling in a very strange way. A few minutes later, the police found him there and arrested him. <laughs> Not the upstairs caller. Oh my god. Oh my god. must be really old because we don't have phone operators anymore. Oh gosh, how long, long ago was that? Phone operators? Was that the 60s, 70s? I think, I don't think they had phone operators in the 80s. I don't think they had that anymore. Since the 70s. That's what I thought. Wow, that's crazy.
a man named Rupert lived with his dog in a house deep in the woods. Rupert was a hunter and a trapper. The dog was a big German shepherd named Sam. Rupert had raised Sam since a pup. Ah, cute. Almost every morning, Rupert went hunting and Sam stayed and guarded the house. One morning, as Rupert was checking his traps, he got the feeling that something was wrong at home. He hurried back as fast as he could, but when he got there, he found that Sam was missing. He searched the house and the woods nearby, but Sam was nowhere to be seen. He called and called, but the dog did not answer. For days, Rupert looked for Sam, but he couldn't find a trace of him. Finally, he gave up and went back to his work. But one morning, he thought he heard something moving in the attic. He picked up his gun. Then he thought, I better be quiet about this. So he took off his boots, and in his bare feet, he began to climb the attic stairs. He slowly took one step, then another, then another, until he reached the last step and the attic door. He stood outside listening, but he didn't hear anything. Then he opened the door. And it all went black. What happened to him? Wow. Bro locked his dog in the attic and forgot about him. How would you get your dog up there? Also, why would you put him up there? Weird. Weird, weird, weird. All right. We have an X-ray of the book. This one's called A.A. Ron Kelly's Bones. A.A. Ron. A.K.A. Aaron, but A.A. Ron. A.A. Ron Kelly was dead. They bought him a coffin and had a funeral and buried him. But that night, he got out of his coffin and he came home. His family was sitting around the fire when he walked in. He sat down next to his widow and he said, What's going on? You all act like somebody died. Who's dead? His widow said, You are. I don't feel dead, he said. I feel fine. You don't look fine, his widow said. You look dead. You'd better get back to the grave where you belong. I'm not going back to the grave until I feel dead, he said. Since A. A. Ron wouldn't go back, his widow couldn't collect his life insurance. Without that, she couldn't pay for the coffin. And the undertaker said he would take it back. A.A. Ron didn't care. He just sat by the fire, rocking in his chair and warming his hands and feet. But his joints were dry, and his back was stiff, and every time he moved, he creaked and cracked. One night, the best fiddler in town came to court the widow. Since A.A. Ron was dead, the fiddler wanted to marry her. The two of them sat on one side of the fire, and A.A. Ron sat on the other side, creaking and crackling. How long do we have to put up with this dead corpse? The widow asked. 
out, stretched himself, shook himself, got up, took a step or two, and began to dance, with his old bones rattling, and his yellow teeth snapping, and his bald head wagging, his arms flip-flopping around, he went, <laughs> and his long legs clicking, and his knee bones knocking. He skipped and pranced around the room. How that dead man danced. But pretty soon, a bone worked loose and fell to the ground. Look at that, said the fiddler. Play faster, said the widow. The fiddler played faster. Chat, is this the NTR? Let's wait till Martin comes. The old man 
jumped up, jumped out the window, and started running. When Martin comes, you tell him I couldn't wait, he called. Oh, giant candle. Yum, 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 yum. They were gonna eat him. Yum, yum, yum. Next story is called The Ghost with the Bloody Fingers. Yuck. A businessman arrived at a hotel late one night and asked for a room. The room clerk told him the hotel was filled up. There was only one empty room. He said, but we don't rent that one because it's haunted. I'll take it, said the businessman. I don't believe in ghosts. My stomach started growling. <laughs> The man went up to the room, he unpacked his things, and he went to the bed. As soon as he did, a ghost came out of the closet. His fingers were bleeding, and it was moaning. Bloody fingers, bloody fingers. When the man saw the ghost, he grabbed his things and ran. The next night, a woman arrived very late. Again, all the rooms were taken except the haunted room. I'll sleep there, she said. I'm not afraid of ghosts. As soon as she got into the bed, a ghost came out of the closet. Its fingers still were bleeding. It was moaning. Bloody fingers, bloody fingers. And the woman took one look and ran. A week later, another guest arrived very late. He also took the haunted room. After unpacked, unpacking, he got out his guitar and he began to play. Soon the ghost appeared. As before, its fingers were bleeding and it was moaning, bloody fingers, bloody fingers. The man paid no attention. He just kept strumming his guitar, but the ghost kept moaning and his fingers kept bleeding. After the 